I think. Uh, Hello, testing. Yes. I'm uh, Walter Paulino from uh, Princeton University. I'm here to give the lecture in origami engineering. Very excited to be here. I hope it's okay. Hello, hello. Uh, it's Walter Paulino here from uh, Princeton University. Very happy to be here. North Carolina State University has a beautiful camp. New buildings, lots of trees, great camp, great for the students, great for the faculty, great for everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, my privilege to introduce Dr. Glossio Polino from Princeton. But before that, I wanted to say that this is our first actually mechanical aerospace engineering distinguished lecture. So we're glad to have a person of Dr. Polino's status to kick, kick this series off for us. So, and we are excited because we've been taking a year and a half to get him here to campus. So we're gonna make it, make the visit really good. Um, as you all know, uh, many of you already know Dr. Polino's work, so let me put my glasses on. I'm getting older here. Uh, Professor Polino is uh, Margareta E. Augustine Professor of uh, Engineering at uh, Princeton. I think he was just before, uh, during the pandemic, he actually moved from Georgia Tech to Princeton. So he was at uh, Georgia Tech for a few years. Um, his area is primarily in the area of computational mechanics uh, in the development of methodologies to characterize the deformation and fracture behavior of existing and emerging materials and structural systems, topology optimization, variational method, deployable structures, and origami engineering, which is what I think many of us are excited to see here today, to see all this great structure that he's uh, design, worked, designed and worked on. And he has received a lot of honors. Uh, just look at his career. You just uh, Google his name, and you'll you'll see a lot of uh, honors that he's received. He's received the Daniel Drucker Medal from ASME, the Raymond uh, Mindlin Medal from ASCE, uh, and the Reddy Medal from the Mechanics of Advanced Materials and Structures. He also received the 2015 uh, Cozzarelli Prize from Na National Academy of Sciences, which recognizes recently published uh, National Academy papers of outstanding scientific excellence and originality. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and, uh, and the former president of the Society of Engineering Science. There are a lot more I could talk about Dr. Polino, but uh, I think I'm more interested in hearing what he has to say about his work. So let's give it up for Dr. Polino. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Much appreciated. I am uh, very happy to be here today. Sorry that uh, it took so long for us to schedule the meeting. Moving during the pandemic uh, has been uh, quite difficult, but I am glad to be here. And uh, Jon gave me a tour of the campus today. It's such a beautiful campus, lots of trees, a wonderful environment. Uh, very happy to be here today. Before we get started, uh, if you don't mind, the people over there are quite far away. We have many chairs here. This, you can also use this table here close. Then uh, you can get a, a better view. You can get a better view of the samples that I am going to show. This will be very interactive, a lot of things to show. And uh, I hope you can uh, learn some new things uh, during the lecture. So I am uh, going to talk about uh, origami engineering, structures, materials, robots. And uh, before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the people that are listed over there. Uh, Filipov, uh, Tashi, Espinosa, Krishna Sami, Zhao, Liu, Pratapa, Novelino, Ze, Wu, Wei, Alderet, and Lin. And uh, everything I am going to show has contributions from them. And uh, this work was sponsored by NSF, JSTS, and uh, the Raymond Allen Jones Chair at uh, Georgia Tech. This is the roadmap of my talk. Uh, origami engineering first, an introduction. Then uh, I am going to talk about uh, the NSF program, uh, EFRI. I worked at NSF uh, for a few years and we helped to create this uh, ODC program, origami design for integration of a self-assembling system for engineering innovation. Then uh, I'll talk about the structural analysis of origami especially bar and hinge models, simplified models, models that can allow us to analyze things like this in a very quick way. Then I'll talk about uh, zipper couple tubes, this one here, tubes and zipper coupling, and uh, then uh, configurational metamaterials, cellular assemblages, and uh, finally some of our recent work on uh, robots with distributed actuation, and then we'll conclude the work. So as a matter of introduction, origami has been used uh, in many fields, and uh, many of you may have uh, played with it uh, when you were a child, for example, as entertainment. Uh, origami now is very big in fashion, uh, the cloth industry. And uh, in education, for example, there is a technique called origametria, 
that uh, was developed to teach mathematics uh, to children, and uh, this has been uh, quite amazing. And uh, here, this is um, my favorite uh, piece of origami. If you count, this is the orchestra by Eric Loisel. Can you count how many musicians you have? How many? Eleven, I hear, thank you. Eleven musicians, eleven instruments. Do you know how many pieces of paper? Twenty-two. One piece of paper for each musician, one piece of paper for each instrument. Every time I see this image, I get moved because uh, this has so much expression, so much life, and uh, so, so much sophistication, finesse. Uh, and uh, this uh, is one of the most fascinating uh, pieces of origami I have ever seen. And the why I'm saying I have seen it, because uh, this uh, piece is in the origami gallery in Japan. If any of you go there, you go to Japan, you have to go to the origami gallery and see this uh, piece of origami by Eric Joazel. It, it will be worthwhile, trust me. This is uh, another piece, just to tell you how sophisticated the field is. This is one single piece of paper, folding only. Origami is very restricted, folding only, one piece of paper. And uh, this is the dragon by Satoshi Kamiya. This is a super complex origami. You can see how the field is now. You can see the level of detail, the horns, the claws, the scales, and you can see the crease pattern to be more realistic is asymmetric, but at the end produces a symmetric model so that you can uh, really get the idea this is a, a dragon. And uh, now going to engineering, whenever I think about uh, applications of origami, what comes into mind are words like a compact, a deployable, prefabricated, self-assembly, tunable, multifunctional, adaptable. And here we have several applications. For example, there is no way that we can go to space with the origami. Because uh, in space, you need huge surfaces, for example, to collect sunlight. And uh, anything that goes in a rocket has to be very small, very light, very compact, and then uh, deploy. And then we have applications in architecture, bellows, mechanical engineering, robotics, and the biomedical field, like the heart stent, for example. And in terms of origami engineering, we need to address topics related to the theory and analysis, the system design. Here we have, uh, on the top right-hand side, the stent for the bunny by Tomohiro Tashi. Thousands of creases, lots of creases. He took 10 hours to fold that bunny, 10 hours. And I love this example because nowadays the computer can build, beat the human in several areas, right? Playing chess, go, uh, the Go game. However, no computer could beat Tomohiro up to now. And I hope it continues like that. Humans are great. And uh, then uh, issues related to materials and fabrication and uh, the kind of, uh, when we go to engineering, in terms of mathematics, in general, the thickness of the origami is considered to be zero, and that allows us to develop lots of mathematical theorems, but uh, when we go to engineering, the thickness play a role, and this is a paper in science, I think it's one of the very first papers that uh, was uh, published, this one here, addressing the thickness, but uh, whenever there is thickness, then it becomes a case-by-case -case basis. It's not as general as uh, the math that can be done when the thickness is zero. Now, the EFRI program, uh, then uh, we uh, developed, uh, helped to develop this Odyssey program, origami design for integration of uh, self-assembly systems for engineering innovation. And uh, this was done around about 10 years ago, and uh, consisted of uh, using uh, math and artistic inspiration. Why these two? Left side of the brain, right side of the brain. Not just engineering and math, the left side, but also artistic inspiration really integrated. That was the goal. I'm not saying the goal was totally achieved, but that was the goal. To integrate the brain, the brain is only one. We should use both sides, not just one side. I have used mostly one side most of my life, but in the past uh, decade or so, I'm trying to use both. And uh, then uh, integrated with active materials, design theory to do origami, and adaptive morphic systems, and the, the main areas were compliant mechanisms, active materials, bio-origami, DNA folding, protein folding, foldable extractors and microextractors. And uh, uh, the reason I am saying the Odyssey, because if you are interested in origami and you do a literature survey, if you type Odyssey, 
you can see the huge amount of, re of research that was sparked in the United States and around of the world after this uh, program. Now, origami has uh, four. If I want the origami to be flat foldable, like this piece that you see at uh, the center by Robert Lang, then uh, there, are some, uh, there are four mathematical rules that I need to satisfy. I need to be able to color it with two colors only. This should be an uh, Eulerian graph, a bipartite graph. Have to satisfy my Kawa theorem, Kawasaki theorem, and the folds should not interpenetrate. I am going to elaborate on this in the next slide. These are the same rules that uh, lead now to engineering inno innovation. Let's go from the math to engineering. And then uh, the uh, origami has to be, if it is flat foldable, I, I should be able to color it with two colors. And you may be familiar with this, right? This is the crease pattern for the very famous crane, right? And then when you fold, is what you get, right? Very nice, huh? okay? That's the uh, two color ability. What else? My Kawa theorem. Whenever I even bring a piece of paper, maybe I can use this one. Yeah. Well, whenever it's so beautiful, I uh, don't want to destroy this one. <laughs> I'll borrow this one. Uh, whenever, for example, we have a uh, we have a vertex like this, for example, and uh, then uh, suppose I have a vertex here. No, no matter how I fold, I can fold as many times as uh, I wish. If this is flat foldable, you can see, is it still flat foldable, right? If this is flat, flat foldable, the difference between mountains and valleys will be two, no more, no less, two, and two only. Since this is yours, maybe you can help me see if we can count here correctly. One mountain, two, Three, four mountains, right? And two valleys. Four minus two is two. It's guaranteed by the math. And uh, another one is the Kawasaki theorem around the vertex. If you number the angles that way, the odd ones should add to pi, and the even ones add to pi, and we should have no interpenetration of faults. So, uh, not right now, I'm teaching a, a class that I introduced in Georgia Tech in origami engineering. and the I taught the class yesterday, actually, it's the first time I am teaching there. And uh, we are using, for example, Legos to teach some of those concepts. And uh, we were inspired by a, a toy company in Japan, and we made, but uh, the angles uh, from uh, the toys, they were uh, limited. Then uh, we made some unit blocks that are equilateral parallelograms with different skew angles. and. We did lots of angles, and then we printed hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, this is very nice. He, the students love to play with the Legos. It's, it's a great way to learn about origami, to learn about mathematics. For example, the differential geometry of origami, uh, the Gauss maps, uh, uh, Gauss curvature, and so on, I teach all using Legos, and they like it. And uh, here, you can do many things. Here is a Miura cube, and uh, here are the Legos. I can pass them around, you see. This is the Lego, for example. Oops. <coughs> for example, I just put them together here. And uh, if I, well, let's say, I did this yesterday, I should be able to do it again. All right. And then uh, you can see that uh, this is the Miura pattern. And the students, they will learn the math, the parameterization, the angles, all, all the math, all the derivation. But then they can also see how the pattern will look at this will be an example, for example, of a rigid origami. This is a, a Miura unit. And then uh, if the student is working by themselves alone, then they have one unit, but they have friends, right? If I would pass this, we don't have time. But then, uh, for example, they work with the friends in this row. You can do a row of the Miura, work with the colleagues in this row. You do a column, and now put everybody together. You do a tessellation. Origami put people together. That's nice. That's very good, you know? And then from the tessellation, if you put several tessellations together, you can do a material, and I am going to illustrate this. And uh, this is uh, what we can do with origami. And uh, what else? I already illustrated it. Ah, another concept is, uh, for example, sometimes the math is uh, difficult to grasp, but if you visualize, for example, you, you did it this way, and we can see that the Miura, for example, here, right? It's developable because you see, if I press here, you can see that I can do the Miura with just one piece of paper. This is a tessellation, 
but now if I change the the butterfly and uh, I do it like this for example you see now there is a hole here it's very clear to see right very visual very clear and then this means uh, I cannot do this pattern with just one piece of paper if I try to do this paper I will need to glue this and then uh, this is the egg box pattern and I can see the flat foldability of the pattern and now if I try to make it flat foldable it's not possible I will break the thing not good you see then but you transform the math into something physical that you relate to at the end of this class we, I am very excited with this class I am teaching it now as you can tell and at the end the students uh, do projects that are very interdisciplinary and uh, they do many different things uh, as you can see there a project in layer gen in origami resistor I have general students from the entire university from electrical civil design computer science uh, operations research and so on and all the teams uh, there is a requirement they have to be intellectually diverse so that they can help each other and uh, achieve the goals of the projects now let's talk about uh, the research and uh, some work we have done on programmable properties of uh, origami for example what happened uh, is uh, the two patterns I talk about uh, is some of the most famous ones the Miura and uh, the egg box it is well known it is quite there is nothing new in this slide is uh, well known that uh, that uh, the Miura has a negative in-plane Poisson ratio, uh, as you could see there, and uh, has a positive one in bending, okay? And uh, the egg box is the opposite, uh, is positive in-plane, it uh, deforms as uh, any other material, like a rubber band, as you stretch, it becomes thinner, and out of plane, then uh, it makes a dome. And uh, this is very easy to see here, as this is the Miura, you can clearly see, see, make this visual, that if I stretch in this direction, I stretch in all the directions, therefore this material has a negative Poisson ratio. But when I bend, you can see clearly that this forms a saddle. Do you see? A saddle? This forms a saddle, right? There is a curvature this way, curvature this way. This forms a saddle. But now, if I just change a little bit, say look the same, but I just change a little bit, this is the, the, the egg box. You can see that it, if I stretch this, it becomes thinner, right? Becomes thinner, like a rubber band. If I stretch, it has a positive Poisson ratio. This direction here becomes thinner and thinner. But uh, when I bend, you may be able to see that I form a dome, right? This is a dome because I'm bending. It's very typical of auxetic materials, materials with a negative Poisson ratio, okay? All right, but see, what's the problem? The problem is that Miura is Miura, egg box is egg box. These are two different things. This is one thing, this is another thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have these properties in the same material system? And, the, and if I am so excited about this, it's because we have done it, right? Otherwise, I would not be so excited. Yeah, and that's what we, we did that I am going to show you. And uh, one thing uh, I would like to point out is that uh, that is uh, when you look at these patterns, I think you can see a lot of beauty, a lot of beauty in the geometry that is translated into the beauty in, in the mathematics, into the beauty of the pattern. And uh, this beauty, you know, is also translated in the derivations that you do. And uh, many times, I, I, may, I may not know how to do the derivation, but uh, when uh, I am working with uh, my students or collaborators, I see an ugly expression. What comes into my mind is that there is something wrong. Jay works in this field. Do you agree, right? Uh, because uh, in general, these, uh, all these symmetries, asymmetries in the origamis, they have to translate very nicely, right, into the mathematics. And uh, this elegance in the mathematics, in the geometric mechanics, was captured, for example, in the work by Mahadevan at Harvard, and that about the Poisson ratio that uh, uh, they found that uh, in uh, bending is given if you parameterize the pattern uh, this way, right, uh, shown here, then uh, you get this expression uh, for the Poisson ratio in bending, and in a stretch you get that expression. You see the only difference? The sign. The magnitude is the same. The magnitude is the same. And then uh, the group in France 
uh, studied this and uh, for the egg box and got the same conclusion, same magnitude and uh, different signs. And uh, now what uh, we have done was, uh, as I anticipated to you, was uh, to create a pattern so that we could embed these configurations in the same material that we call the morph origami. And uh, that's what uh, you see here. And uh, now, if, uh, now it's the same. Here, I'm, what I showed you before, here is the work that I did. Now, if you encode the neural mode in, in the material, you get this, and then you get the properties that uh, you see over there on the left. And if you encode the egg box, then uh, you are going to get the same properties that uh, you see here on the left. But now it's the same material system. So what can we do with this? Ah, one thing that we did, we did a lot of the math to see if that relationship was uh, satisfied. And uh, by the way, uh, how I forgot to mention, the, the definition of uh, the Poisson ratio in bending is very similar to stretch. Stretch is, uh, you define it as uh, the negative of the ratio of stretches, right? The transverse by the longitudinal. For bending, is similar is uh, the ratio of curvatures in uh, two orthogonal directions. And uh, then uh, we got this expression, but then when we did the same calculation for the stretch, we get this expression. If you compare, the only difference is the sign. So very uh, beautiful result. And uh, this work was published in TRL, and uh, the reference is over there. But uh, one question that we had is uh, each one of us, we were working with separate patterns. Could we have uh, a general mathematical theory for this? And that's what we did next. But uh, before I show you next, I'll show you what you can do with those models, okay? Uh, here, for example, if I encode uh, Miura on this side and egg box on this side, what do we get? Uh, when we bend it, you see here, it bends more or less like a dome, and here more or less like a saddle, and there is a transition in between, more or less as expected. And now I can do an infinite number of uh, material combination and encoding, because I can encode uh, each mode any way I wish. And now if I alternate them like this, then uh, when I bend, it will look like that. And uh, the key idea was we had worked uh, in different patterns, uh, separate ones, um, and each group is uh, doing the mathematical derivations for each one. Could we have a general theory that uh, would explain this result? And uh, this work just uh, came out. Uh, we worked for many years on this. Uh, there's a paper in TNAS on discrete symmetries, control geometric mechanics in parallelogram-based origami. And uh, this was published a few weeks ago. And uh, essentially here, we use the first fundamental form of a differential geometry and the second fundamental form uh, coupled with a mechanistic uh, theory to uh, explain the behavior. It is a formalism that uh, we have shown can be applied to all previous derivations that uh, have been done, and uh, hopefully more. The reference is uh, provided over there. All right, now let's talk about tubes. And you see one here, combination of tubes. Let's talk about them very briefly. Uh, maybe just uh, to make sure uh, I, sh I want to have uh, time for the Q&A. What time should I finish the talk so that we can have a discussion? Around 11. But then after 11, we can still have the Q&A. Oh, great. Then, uh, all right, then uh, let's talk about uh, Miura again. What happened is, uh, and uh, I like to demonstrate to, because you make this visual. This is a Miura strip. Remember, we talked about this. And uh, then if I put uh, two strips together, right, uh, you can see it's going to form a tube, right? Can you see me? I cannot. No? But I see a hole there. Yeah, I can you see, see me? It. Yeah, yeah, you form a tube, right? So like this, right? So, uh, and then uh, I like tubes. We are going to study tubes. And uh, then uh, there has been a lot of work done with kinematic folding, what happens is if the origami is rigid, like the one you do with the Legos, okay? Then uh, kinematics would explain uh, everything, the, the entire behavior. But uh, if the ori origami is not rigid, like paper is not rigid, and many plastics and uh, many materials are not rigid, then depending oh, not just on the material, the material and uh, the configuration, then uh, the mechanics will play a role. And, uh, 
we want to look at the elastic uh, deformations of uh, those systems. And uh, what we did was to develop a simplified uh, model. In general, uh, the first idea would be to do a finite element mesh to study systems like that and put the boundary conditions below and do the nonlinear analysis. But uh, this is extremely expensive. Uh, if you work with FEM just to generate the mesh and having a shell mesh, uh, a mesh made of shells that is correct, just to have the, the information correct, takes some effort. And uh, also, take a look at origami, the thickness is very, very small, right, compared to the other dimensions. And uh, in shell theory, as the thickness becomes small and small, the, the element that we use tend to become uh, worse and worse behaved, uh, tend to become unstable. And then uh, can, we, can we have a simplified theory that will not capture 100% of the behavior, but will give a lot of insight on the behavior? That was the idea here. And then we considered uh, just three basic deformation modes, panel shear and stretch. And uh, we use uh, for each panel those bars that you see. And uh, here is a, is a simplified model of uh, the cube. And uh, then we also consider the panel bending. And in general, we consider that the panel uh, will bend uh, along the shortest diagonal. Because you see there is a long diagonal, a short diagonal. And in general, if you look, most of the bending happens along the shortest diagonal. And then uh, we have uh, rotational springs there. And uh, also for the crease, this is the crease, right, that you can see here, the crease pattern. For the crease, we also have another hinge. So we have bar and hinges. And uh, then uh, once we do, <laughs> this has been studied by a few colleagues. And uh, then uh, here are a few references. And uh, what we can do then uh, is uh, to compute the stiffness uh, for each of the cases, uh, the one in a uh, stretch, the one in, uh, in bending. And in general, the folding one is a function of the one in bending because uh, the relative stiffness of uh, the facet with respect to the fold plays a major role. And then uh, I can build uh, a stiffness matrix and uh, build a stiffness method and uh, look at the behavior. Okay? And uh, the key idea is that uh, we can uh, look not just uh, at uh, the rigid behavior, but also the uh, non-rigid. And uh, I made the point that, in general, if you try to do a finite element mesh, this is a work by Pellegrino at Caltech. You can see that uh, the, the work uh, is tremendous. And uh, I just wanted to do something here that, in a few minutes, you can do a similar analysis. Maybe you will not get uh, a complete solution, 100% of what you are looking for, but you will get a lot of insight. And uh, then we try to generalize these ideas and uh, develop uh, this uh, method just with two basic uh, elements. One is the bar element, and we use a hyperelastic uh, constitutive model. And uh, here is the strain energy density. But since this is 1D, instead of working with tensors, then everything will be scaled and then uh, do one derivative of the energy function with respect to the strains, get the stress, another derivative, then I get the tangent module. And then this gives me all the information that I need uh, to build uh, my D matrix, uh, my finite element method, uh, the strains, the internal forces, and uh, the stiffness, considering both material and uh, geometric nonlinearities. And uh, a, a very interesting uh, aspect uh, it was about the rotation. And then uh, what we did was uh, to consider the rotation similarly to the deformations. And uh, then the key idea is to capture between two panels, right? Then uh, we have these uh, rotational springs here, and I have this angle theta. And then uh, what uh, we have uh, is uh, we can then uh, propose uh, in a energy functional in terms of uh, this angle theta. And then I do one derivative, I'll get the, more, the, mo the moment, another derivative, the tangent modulus. And uh, this becomes very important uh, because uh, if you have an expression like this, what happens is whenever this angle, you can just take a look here, whenever this angle gets close to 0 or close to 2 pi, you are going to have contact, a local contact. And then this gives me an uh, energy barrier right, uh, that will avoid uh, the local contact. Not every contact, okay? Uh, not every contact, but the local one. 
And that this also gives me the entire information I need to build my vector of internal forces and the stiffness matrix. And uh, one aspect, even when you are dealing uh, with finite deformations, is that uh, the origami, right? Uh, you have to be able to describe the entire behavior. Let's say the dihedral angle here now is close to zero, but if I am looking at this angle and I go this way, now the angle is two pi. And I have to be able to describe this entire range of behavior. In general, in structures, you never go to that extreme, but in origami, this is necessary. And uh, one uh, idea is how to describe this angle in a unique way. And uh, then uh, you can see that, uh, for example, if I just use uh, an arc cosine function here, then uh, I can only differentiate the angles between 0 and pi. I cannot do a differentiation between uh, pi and 2 pi. But then uh, if I use the sine function, then I get a discontinuity here. It's not good, but if I use the modulo operation together with the sine, I get the red line, and then between 0 and 2 pi, I get uh, an identity here that will allow me uniquely to uh, determine the angles and any properties that I need associated to the angle. And uh, I already mentioned this is very important to differentiate the angles uniquely in the entire range of deformation from 0 until 2 pi. Then uh, I need to do the uh, derivatives, right, uh, in order to compute uh, our force vectors and the stiffness matrices. And uh, what happened is, uh, as you can see, and uh, most of my work before in uh, finite deformations uh, was based on trigonometric uh, relations. But whenever I use trigonometric relations, when you do the derivatives, look what happened. You get uh, this here, these trigonometric functions in the denominator. And uh, whenever you have a singularity in the computer, this is a problem. What happened is the limit. Uh, may be finite, but the computer doesn't know that. If you compute this at zero, this will be zero, right? Then you have a singularity. Then the key idea for us to have a, a robust formulation was to get rid of uh, tri trigonometric functions. And they are too messy. We didn't want trigonometric functions. And then we were able to rewrite this uh, using tensor and vector products in the way that uh, you see here. And at the end, this expression can be written this way. All the quantities are finite then uh, we have a simple, elegant, clear way of uh, sorting out these derivatives and building our internal force vectors and uh, the stiffness matrix. Stiffness matrix, I need the Hessian, right? I need the second derivative. And uh, the same way, I can do all the math. And uh, I define uh, these uh, tensor products here this way. And then you can see we can uh, rewrite them in a way that uh, everything is very clear, well-defined and that well behaved and all the details are explained here in this paper. And uh, for the solution scheme, we use a modified generalized displacement control method that is similar to an arc lamp. And the modifications are uh, explained uh, on these uh, papers here that uh, we wrote. And then these allow us to do very complicated things, for example. Yeah, for example, uh, there is a paper in science uh, was published a few years ago, I think by Silversberg, right, that they have the pop-through defects. Silversberg, right? Yeah. Then, uh, for example, the, the problem is like this, that uh, you can uh, press this, and uh, you can see that uh, this is bistable, right, uh, because it has two stable states. But then uh, this causes a lot of deformation here around and so on. Trying to do this with FTM is possible, but would take a lot of time. And uh, here with Merlin, uh, we can do this in a minute. And uh, actually, this simulation uh, is available on my website. You can see that when we track the force displacement relations at this point, then uh, you, you have uh, yeah, you have a snap through, a snap back. And uh, then uh, we can also get uh, the energy profile as a function of uh, the number of increments. And you can see the. We only consider three basic deformation modes, that is the stretching, bending, and folding. And you can see in this case, as expected, all of them are finite and quite relevant. And that this can uh, allow me to, to explore this for uh, many um, kind of analysis that I may have in origami, for example, with a simple model like that, that may include not just mechanics, but also multifunctional physics. And uh, I was planning uh, to give a demo uh, with uh, the MATLAB code, but uh, 
in the interest of time, I think I will skip that. But uh, the Merlin software, I think, uh, is available on my website, and it's very easy to get there. You, I hope you can uh, download it and uh, play with it. I think, Jay, you have, you know the Merlin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did, maybe I can ask you a dangerous question. Did you like it? Yes. <laughs> Oh, the, the Merlin, yes, that's great. <laughs> All right. So now uh, let's talk about uh, the behavior of uh, tubes. And uh, you, you can see that, for example, uh, if we, we want to investigate the behavior by means of uh, an eigen analysis, and uh, then here K is the stiffness uh, matrix and the mass matrix, lambda the eigenvalue and V the eigenvector, and uh, we wanted to see how uh, these systems would behave. And uh, you can see that uh, if we look at the eigenvalue versus the extension of uh, the sheet of paper, then there is not much there. Uh, of the, 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 the modes are commingling and so on. And uh, I start here with seven because uh, the first six are rigid body modes, right? Three translations, three rotations. And uh, so there is not much we can do. And uh, then, but uh, something interesting is that uh, this is a Mura tube, all right? Then uh, when I put two um, Mura sheets together, and uh, then uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a small band gap here between the first uh, two modes that are illustrated there. And then uh, this motivated us to look at the uh, different uh, alignments. Uh, for example, I if I do something like, uh, See if I can do it correctly. Yeah. If I put uh, the tube like this, and I'm showing to the camera, then uh, this is the align configuration, okay? And then uh, another possibility is to do a tube inside a tube, like this configuration here, okay, that I am showing. But this has a problem, because this is a unit cell. You can see that the in interior tube is going to constrain the deformation. At some point, this is going to lock, right? It's very clear, this is going to lock. And uh, finally, then uh, we came with this idea of uh, the zipper tube. By the way, this is a zipper tube uh, that you see over there. And uh, then the key idea was uh, to join this in a zipper type configuration. This is the zipper configuration, okay? That's the one you see here, you see? Uh, it essentially is a glide reflection uh, that uh, you explore here. This is the zipper configuration. And let's see what happens. So you can see, essentially, we wanted a, a very flexible mode, a near zero stiffness mode, and all the other modes to be stiff, okay? So that we could have a, a kinematic mode. That's what we wanted. And uh, then you can see that uh, here, for the single tube, then uh, the, <coughs> the band gap is shown here between the first two modes. For the align, not much different. For the internal, uh, what happened is uh, at some point this will lock, right? But then, look what happened with the zipper. We were very happy when uh, we got this result. You can see that uh, th there is a, a very low stiffness mode, and uh, that's the mode that uh, this uh, zipper, you see, is this uh, extensional mode. See, I touch just in one location, and you can see it deploys, right? It, it's very, very nice. And uh, all the other modes, bending, twist, and so on, if you play with it, you can see the NIV is much, much, much higher. And uh, then we were very excited with this. And uh, this is related to the, this paper that appeared in, in PNAS and uh, the Cosarelli uh, Prize that uh, the colleague mentioned a few minutes ago. And uh, why does this work? Uh, let's, uh, we analyzed this with Merlin, with the bar and hinge model. Just take a look here. We only have three basic deformation modes, folding, bending, and stretch. You can see that for the first mode, this extensional mode of uh, the zipper, right? This extensional mode that you see, clearly see here, then uh, almost all the energy is in folding. That's what you want, and very little in bending. And for all the higher order modes, then you are uh, engaging the panels in uh, shear, stretch, and bending. And moreover, in this analysis here, you can see that the energy for the first mode is just a little bit of uh, the energy that is used in the other modes. And uh, if you look at the decomposition here of energy, you can see that 
for the first mode, most of the energy here is red, is unfolding, but for the higher order mode here, there is a lot of shear, and here there is a lot of bending and a lot of shear, right? And uh, that's what uh, explains the behavior of uh, the zipper. And uh, what do we do with this, okay? What do we do with it? One thing that we can do is to play with it. Uh, uh, actually, we do some workshops in, uh, uh, in origami, and uh, this is one of the activities that we do in workshop. The kids love it, and uh, if the kids love, the adults also should like, right? So, maybe you can play with your kids, Jim. So, what can we do with this? Then uh, we can uh, investigate cellular assemblages, for example, and do a metamaterial. So, what I did here was uh, to have the uh, aligned tubes in this direction, the zipper in that direction, and now what we have is a configurational metamaterial. Most materials, right? Like this, like the table here, right? So, plastic, one configuration, one, one configuration only, right? But here, as you, as you can see, right, uh, here, then we have an infinite number of configurations, infinite, infinite number of configurations, and uh, you can see it here. See, this is a prototype, we just uh, did it, uh, and uh, this was made with paper, you can see it's flat foldable this way, right? It's flat foldable this way, right? And uh, it's very, very stiff this way, and we investigated this, and uh, this is what we got, okay? As you can see, very stiff in the Z direction, very, very soft in the X direction for most of the deployment range. Very soft also in the Y direction in a very big range, but there is a, an instability point here that I want to explain to you why. What happened is this. You see that uh, these uh, panels, I don't know if you can see, I'll try to illustrate. These panels, when I deform, they are aligned in one direction. There will be a point that they will be fully aligned, horizontal, and then the, the, the material has to decide if it will go left or right, and uh, that's that instability point, you see? It, it has to decide if it goes this way or that way. Can you see? And uh, that's that instability point. All right, so, and this has very interesting properties. For example, if I compress in one direction in X, Y plane, I compress in all the directions, then there is a negative force on radius that is in, in that plane, and some other properties that are quite interesting. What can I do with this? Maybe I like uh, this configuration here. I don't know if it is that one I am going to show, but suppose I like one of them, there is an infinite, and then I can freeze uh, that configuration, I can print it uh, or do another manufacturing and uh, investigate it, and uh, that's what we did, for example, uh, using a digital light processing, and uh, there is a paper in soft matter where we investigate a lot of the mechanics and uh, the properties of uh, these uh, zipper metamaterial systems. And uh, what else can, we, can you do? You can do an interlocking system. Uh, again, uh, if you think about math, if the thickness here was zero, this, uh, everything here would be zero, but in reality there is a thickness. And uh, what you can see there is that uh, there are two scales. Uh, one scale is the structural scale, that is this one, right, the big one. And another scale is this one, right, uh, the cellular scale of uh, this uh, system here. Then uh, maybe this could be a building in the future. I don't know if Elon Musk goes to Mars. Maybe that could be used. Uh, what else can we do? Here, uh, we can do, for example, if there is an emergency and uh, we need a short-term bridge, then uh, here uh, is illustrating there, and this is a prototype, then uh, this thing could be deployed, and uh, here is the bridge, right? Here is the bridge. And these are all zipper tubes. There are only zipper tubes here, okay? Only zipper. And you can see it's pretty strong, as we knew, because we did the eigen analysis. It has a very soft mode for deployment, and all the other modes are very, very strong, okay? And uh, now I want to talk about scaling, right? For example, here is the scale of my hand, everything I showed. This is a bigger scale. We are in the meter scale, right? And, uh, but what about, we have people here from micro, nanotechnology, right? Well, what about micro-nano? Can we explore this at uh, the lower level scales? And uh, then uh, this is a work that we did on micro-scale origami-architected metamaterials. And then what essentially what we did, we did this, but uh, the size now will be 100 microns. Uh, if it is 100 microns, this is the size of your head, right? Size of your head. Take a look there. 
See, these are 30 micro, more or less. Uh, these may have three bars here, two and a half, three, around 100 or so, right? The size of your head. And uh, how did we do this? Uh, well, here are the typical dimensions. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can do a rigid origami model to understand the kinematics of uh, the system. And then we did this with a 3D direct laser right, uh, um, writing using a two-photon polymerization technique, a nano-scribe machine. And actually, this was done at Northwestern with uh, your uh, former advisor, Horacio and uh, Sirida Krishnasamy. And uh, you may recall this, right? Uh, this, uh, to test this, uh, we wanted to do the mechanical testing. Then uh, we used uh, the EC2 SEM mechanical testing at uh, Northwestern University at Horacio's lab. And uh, then you can see some very nice properties. One of them is that uh, here, these are actual numbers uh, from the EC2 SEM testing. You can see this is highly anisotropic. Just take a look. The stiffness, if I do the test in the X direction, it is small and it's very different from the one in the Z direction. And the, the Y one is the intermediate uh, stiffness. So it's very anisotropic. And uh, another thing very interesting is that, uh, and uh, these are polymer type materials. The material here is the IP, DIP of uh, nano Skype. And uh, then uh, if we do uh, express strain, uh, test, what you can see was that we have to modulate and load is the displacement versus time, modulate and load. I'll show you one of the tests. And then uh, what you can see that I have a hardening type behavior and more or less a plateau type behavior. But uh, what I want to call your attention is this. As uh, we go here, then uh, you can see that uh, when we reach five, look, this is extremely deformed, right? A huge deformation, right? You can see here that is uh, stage five, that is this point. But then, when I unload this, and uh, I wait about uh, half an hour or so, it's quite amazing the recovery capabilities of uh, this material system at uh, the micro nano scale. We almost come back to the point uh, where we started. And uh, if you do go in another direction, again, the stress strain behavior, totally different, tremendously uh, anisotropic system, just change the direction. Now you can clearly see that this is purely a hardening type behavior, more or less. And uh, again, uh, has very beautiful uh, recoverability capabilities. And uh, this is a kind of a monotonic uh, test in the, let's see. Yes, this is the monotonic test. Uh, just to see you, uh, take a, just to show you, take a look here, this 20 microns. And uh, then you can see that uh, as we keep loading this, this has tremendous structure, tem tremendous uh, interactions, and it starts to have a global buckling behavior, as you can see here, and then local contact, and so on. And we gave some preliminary explanation about this using a block wave uh, theory argument. And at the end, uh, the system will be recovered. Uh, if we wait, as I said, we unload, and uh, wait about half an hour, then uh, we almost recover. And uh, this here, then uh, another thing we looked was uh, to investigate, uh, here is the Poisson ratio versus this angle C here. And uh, there is a sweet spot here, around 45 degrees. If we go to the left, the Poisson ratio is positive. Go to the, to the right here, the Poisson ratio is negative. We investigated that experimentally, and that's indeed what we found. And uh, then uh, this, if you are interested in more details, this is a paper in small. This is the cover, and uh, we can see that we could have uh, with architected metamaterials, we have large degree of shape recoverability, very anisotropic properties that we can play with it, right? It's very nice to play with it, and uh, has reversible auxeticity. That means you can go to a positive Poisson ratio, go back, go to negative, go back, and keep doing that. Finally, I, I will briefly finish uh, talking about some of our recent work with uh, origami robots with uh, distributed actuation. I, I, I like uh, robots very much, uh, but, uh, and I know there is a lot of work being done in robotics here. Uh, Jay is doing some, uh, Yong is doing some very nice work, and the other colleagues here. But uh, I was talking to Yong, right? Uh, when I, I see those robots from uh, Boston Dynamics, they are fantastic, right? They dance, they walk. Those things are bulky, heavy. 
And they put everything inside the robot, the power supply, the controls, materials, the, the entire systems, everything, right? It's very, very, very bulky. Uh, and then uh, the key idea is, uh, can we have robots that are more uh, elegant, that are very light, uh, and uh, that don't have wires? Either you put the energy, the power supply inside the robot, or you use tethers, right? If you use a power supply here, right? Use this here, right? right? You are going to need a uh, cable, right? And then what uh, we would like to do is to use magnetic field to do the actuation. Because a magnetic field is very nice for the human being. Who has here ever done an MRI in the hospital? See, it's an MRI. So the magnetic field is good for the human. I have also have done one. It's good. It's nice, right? It doesn't cause any harm. So why not? Let's use it. All right. So here then, here then, we are going to use the Kreslin origami. And uh, actually, uh, this uh, you can buy. I'm not getting any money to do this advertising, OK? But you can buy in uh, Amazon. That's where I bought this. This is a wine bottle, for example, that is inspired in the Kreslin pattern. And uh, then uh, when the bottle is not used, then you can have it flat foldable. And you can play with it, right? This is the Kreslin pattern. And uh, what we did was uh, to put, here is the Kreslin, made of paper. We put a magnetic plate here. And uh, then we have the magnetic field. And uh, then what uh, you see is we can actuate each unit. And uh, this is, I am showing again and again, because you can see that it's very fast. And now I am going to show 20 times it's lower. And many times when uh, some people work with, uh, let's say, uh, temperature, humidity, or uh, pH, and so on, they, in the papers, they put 20 times faster. Here I am putting 20 times slower because I want to emphasize that uh, if we, we, we want robots that are responsive, you don't want to say, OK, do this movement. OK, after 10 hours, this will be done. You don't want that. Another beauty, I told you there is tremendous elegance and beauty in origami. Another beauty is that the Kreslin pattern, you can do it in your home. Uh, the Kreslin pattern can be done spontaneously. Take a look here. You just pick up two things and you apply uh, compression and twist. You get the pattern over there. Okay? And uh, then uh, this is the way we can do it. We can make this to be bistable. That means we have two stable states. Uh, the folded one and the deployed one, as you can see here. And then we are going to apply the magnetic field and uh, to change from one to the other. And uh, what happened is this. In general, we use uh, niodymium iron boron particles uh, to magnetize the material and magnetize it in a certain direction. OK, let's say the yellow direction. You can choose, right? A and then when we apply the magnetic field, then the yellow tries to align with the red. And uh, that's what causes the uh, kinematic, the change. And what is the beauty, what is the beauty about uh, the Kreslin unit is that uh, the axial deformation and uh, the twist, they are coupled. And uh, this uh, can give us uh, a lot of uh, creativity and intuition in mechanics on what to do with it. And uh, then, uh, essentially, when uh, we look at uh, the torque of the system that we are going to apply in the system uh, versus the angle, what happens is uh, here is the behavior. If we uh, apply a torque using the magnetic field that is below this uh, barrier here, then nothing will happen. But if I apply the red one, then it will change from one state to the next. And here I can see the variation of uh, the angle of uh, the angle the magnetization angle versus the magnetic field. And then, uh, for example, if I am here, I can move to the state one and vice versa. Then I can go from the deployed to the folded state and uh, vice versa. Okay? And uh, here now is are two units. And uh, here is uh, the system, for example, that uh, we can use this as a computing system, binary zero and one. I have. Uh, if I use n units, I am going to have two to the power of n states. And the, the, the Kreslin is very nice. This, this one, uh, you see here, for example, 
I think everyone can see. This is the crest in how many colors you see. Two, what are the colors? Red and blue, right? Well, people talk to me. That's uh, because <laughs> almost an hour. Let's make this more uh, interactive. What about now? Mostly red. Thank you. And you see, and uh, actually, uh, this is this simple idea that kids like to play with is what motivated us to create uh, some of the robots that we created. I will not have time to explain all the details, but uh, what happened is some of the robots I am going to show at, at the end. This is a dipole. Why a dipole? Because the red has a chirality this way, the blue this way. So dipole because one cancels the other. And then we put two dipoles together, and that was our robot. Okay? This will be the final slide. All right, so, but then, uh, if I use two here just for simplicity, and uh, I have these maps, uh, what is nice is, as you can see, to avoid the noise, as you can see, oops, as you can see, uh, for example, I can start with the zero, zero state. Zero means uh, folded, right? And one, deployed. It's always like that. And uh, these are all by stable, right? Start here with the zero, zero, and then, from the zero, zero, I can go to one, zero. Then I can go from here to there. Everybody with me? Okay, zero, zero, and now it's one, deployed, zero, correct? This one. A and then, if I pick up the one, zero, I can go to one, one, both deployed. Everybody with me? Okay? And now, if I pick up the one, one, right? Then, I can go to zero, one, right? And uh, I, if I pick up the zero, one, I can go to zero, zero. And uh, then uh, I can, with the magnetic field, I can achieve any state that I want. And uh, you may immediately see, oh, I, I can see here that uh, I, I cannot go directly from this to that one. Yes, you are right, you cannot. Uh, how can you go? It's not here. Uh, the map is here, cannot go. But if you go this one first, you get that. Oh, it's fine, it's fine. All right. Okay, and uh, then we build uh, a, a machine house to test this. This was built at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, essentially with uh, Chris uh, and uh, Larissa. And uh, then uh, we tested it, and then uh, one thing that uh, then we measured was the force versus displacement, as uh, you can see here. What happened is uh, because uh, the testing, the, because of the boundary condition, we could not get the negative force, but all of them have a negative force here. But when it is snaps, uh, we couldn't get that in the machine at that time. And uh, now, I want to call your attention. Look, look how simple this is, but how insightful. Look, these are bistable systems, right? We have two stable states. And uh, here is the maximum force that uh, each one of them have. If you look, the red has the highest height, and uh, the green is the shortest one. And uh, that means that, uh, and you can see that it is, uh, the force is proportional to the height. Then. Now, geometry becomes mechanics, mechanics becomes geometry. Instead of uh, controlling the, uh, the force and the uh, energy instabilities, right, I can uh, do the design just in terms of the geometry because I know it. So very simple, but very elegant. And uh, then I can use this, for example, to tune mechanical properties because now, for example, I can uh, program this with m as many units as I want. And uh, then, uh, for example, you can clearly see, based on what I explained to you, if I compress this, which one will buckle first? This one, the lowest height. And then which one? Next. This one, this one, that one, right? I already know. So, and uh, then uh, I can go and uh, do the test of each of them, and then I can tune them and use them as uh, I wish, as you can see over there. And uh, finally, I have a magneto, uh, mecano electric, uh, in assembly, and then uh, we use the Ashimit uh, trigger uh, to do the electrical part, as uh, you can see here. And then, uh, for example, to uh, do the contact, we use a copper tape. So what happened is, and I am going to show an animation you are going to see. When uh, these switches here are closed, I identify the stable state zero. You see, this one here will be activated because uh, of the way the copper tape is put inside. Uh, will indicate to me that that unit is closed, is folded. And uh, if the switch is open, this one, then it will go this way. 
and we will indicate that I am in the stable state one. Okay? And uh, here is what we get. Yeah, then uh, here is uh, the torque. Uh, I can change from uh, one state to the other, as you can see, and uh, here is the Schmidt trigger electrical system. Uh, and then I can indicate if, uh, maybe I will stop there. Then I can please explain, let's see if I can stop. Oh, great. You see, what happened is this. Uh, then uh, the, it's a magneto, because I have the magnets here. Mikeno, because of the origami, uh, all the mechanical properties, and electric. But then what happened is, take a look here. The blue light, that is this one, remember when I was explaining, indicate the folded state. Now, the yellow is on because this is folded, and the red is on because this is folded in the zero, one, one state. Make sense? Okay, and uh, now, and uh, finally, this uh, is what just came out in Science Advances, where uh, we did uh, a Kresling-inspired uh, micro-robot, and uh, this is very small. This is uh, just about a centimeter, this, this size. And uh, then uh, one idea is that in the future, for example, if there is uh, for drug delivery, if there is a problem here, or an ulcer, or that some drug is the blue needs to be delivered, then the robot can come here, and uh, what I like are multifunctional units. Then uh, you have some units of the Kreslin that will be uh, responsible for the locomotion. Oh, it's over there. That uh, will be responsible for the locomotion, okay? That is based uh, on this kind of mechanism. But uh, there will be, but we can use one of the units, for example. Uh, the beauty of this is that uh, we can make this hollow and put a drag inside. And then uh, when uh, we, you reach that location, you can pump it uh, if you pump once, you deliver a little bit of drug. You pump more, you deliver more drugs, okay? And uh, I will not have time to explain it, but the reference is over there. And uh, finally, uh, we have covered a lot today, an introduction, uh, talked about the bar and hinge model, the Merlin system to do the computational analysis, the zipper coupled tubes, uh, looked at configurational metamaterials, untethered uh, magnetic actuation for robots, and the structural tuning through reconfiguration. And finally, uh, this is the zipper tube. Uh, do you, I came, I flew here, right? I came flying, uh, right? Yesterday I, I taught at uh, Princeton, I was flying. Do you think I could bring this in the airplane? Answer me, folks, yes or no? Not like that, right? <laughs> but what about like that? Thank you very much. about this process and development? Very good question. I, well, uh, there are, uh, we tried, uh, Jason, what happened is my entire life, just remember, right, the, the, best, uh, the best way to learn new things is uh, especially the artistic part is when you are young. I started to work in origami when, uh, in 2009 when I was at NSF. Uh, what uh, ha happened is uh, then uh, we try to see some of uh, the beauty and uh, the art that appears in the pattern through the things that uh, we know because we don't know the fine art part, I don't know. But uh, for example, the symmetries, uh, trying to analyze this from a mathematical point of view, the asymmetries, uh, symmetry and asymmetry, and uh, the geometrical configurations uh, that are associated with the behavior, the beauty of uh, the system, uh, I think uh, that's what allow us to do the work that we do. I can give you one example, two examples. Uh, one is that uh, we have a, a paper uh, where we explain the behavior of uh, the pleated uh, 
origami in terms of uh, the hyperbolic paraboloid configuration. Uh, I think some of the colleagues here in the field working on this may have seen this paper. And uh, finally, we could do a math, but it was not well known if you change the flipping, if the solution of the system is still a quadratic equation like the hyperbolic paraboloid. Many mathematicians tried to work with this before. And uh, we do not know as much math as they, they know, absolutely not. But we know the mechanics and uh, we have the intuition. And uh, based on that, we were able to give a formal proof. It is in the journal Nature Communication that uh, we had a lot of fun with and we were very happy. And uh, this is a process that developed. Uh, this one, but uh, the one I really like to talk, give him a good day. Uh, this one, I really like uh, what happened is I gave the advice to to the student to work with tube configurations, like a single tube, uh, a line tube, uh, cross configurations like this, okay? and lots of configurations. And then uh, he had, uh, he and some of the assist, the colleagues there, did a lot of tubes, all right? And then uh, we have a lot of garbage in the paper. But good garbage, it's like nice paper. And then uh, when you do things like that, you do some by mistake. And uh, this was a mistake. It's a good mistake. So, but those I don't know how to explain. I wish we could have more mistakes like that. But Yes. Oh, Jim. The microphone, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, amazing talk and also amazing, amazing work. Thank you. Um, so, I have a one, actually, I have two general questions. But the uh, first one is uh, uh, so about the size effect of this origami structure. You show the micro scale and also you show the centimeter scale and also meter scale. So, I saw, you know, the slides maybe 64, you know, the XYZ, the isotopic stiffness, XY is a compliant, right? So, Z is a stiff. Correct. So, you know, the, for the centimeter scale, it seems that, uh, you know, x, y direction, the stiffness is the same, kind of uh, close to each other. But, uh, you know, on the micro scale, I see that actually they have, uh, you know, they are different, right? So, uh, x, how, how, how you expand this side the, effect? The you know? Excellent, uh, excellent observations, yes. The devil is in the details, right? Uh, what happened is this. Uh, the one you are talking about, that, uh, for example, the uh, x uh, and y, and even here you can see the stiffness is very similar. Yeah. But take a look here. This was made with paper, the material here is paper, and uh, look at also the manufacturing. The way we did was to put the tubes together, then uh, at every layer you, you have twice the amount of material that you don't need, but you have twice the amount of material. Now, when we went, uh, actually things at the micro nano scale were very different, the behavior, very different. Uh, and the most of the properties we don't get in this system. And uh, the main reason uh, for uh, that uh, anisotropy that uh, you see over there is because uh, we use polymers, and that was the IP, DIP uh, material, and uh, then uh, also always single layer, as I showed. Uh, and then the material tem tends to be uh, very uniform, and, uh, and uh, at that scale, with that material, uh, then uh, those uh, were the, the properties uh, that uh, we got. But uh, let's say the, the manufacturing, the material, and uh, the details of uh, the manufacturing, they will play a major role on the properties that you are going to get. And also the scaling and the scale that you work. For example, in this scale, gravity becomes very important. In that scale, gravity is irrelevant. And then uh, if we keep uh, Minia to rise in that, then uh, uh, weak forces, for example, will become more uh, important. And also another problem we have, adhesion. Sometimes adhesion is a killer, you know. Uh, and uh, you say the, the thorough explanation for the scaling that we don't have. Uh, we have observations. We are very much interested to have a, a general theory or a general explanation regarding the scaling. We do not have that. Yes. Yeah, for that bridge, I see you put some weight on there. That's a static load, right? Correct. How that will happen, you have a dynamic load. 
Excellent question. Maybe we can work together if we do the <laughs> dynamic load. Uh, we did some work uh, related to dynamics and block wave, but not with the bridge. As, this is as much as we did. Uh, and also, as you can see, this uh, material here is a paper prototype. I was thinking that uh, maybe we could uh, change the material, maybe uh, do wood and uh, stain wood and, and do a, a bigger prototype, maybe one that maybe first a, a dog can go through the bridge and then maybe later a human being. But uh, we have not done that. Uh, yeah, the dynamic uh, aspect is uh, very, very important. We have not investigated that for this system. There is one more. Uh, uh, Gadir has a. Gadir has a. On the behavior of these structures. Do you think there's a limit? What are the limits on the thickness where the thickness starts to interfere with the geometric properties for some of these configurations? And have you seen any? Excellent question, Gadir. Yes, uh, th there is a limit, uh, for example, especially in uh, space applications. And uh, the work that comes into my mind is the work by Sergio Pellegrino at Caltech that uh, he's working with JPL uh, to deploy some huge uh, booms and systems uh, in space that are extreme. We are talking about extremely, extremely thin. And uh, they have been uh, investigating uh, those systems. And uh, one of his former students, uh, Maynard, uh, who just became a faculty member at Stanford, is also investigating that. Maybe I can refer you to their work. It's quite fascinating. But things change a lot, change tremendously, uh, change a lot. And they have been working on this for many years. Yeah. Excellent question. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. No, thank and you. I appreciate uh, your response here. I was not early on the desert floor. So <laughs> <laughs> but thank we'll you. work on it next time. Right? Now that we're all inspired with it. Yeah, you know, some little goodies from our department. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I was very happy uh, to you. be here. Thank you. Thank you.